Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, June 22nd, 2015. Tonight we're going to look at Greece and at Venezuela, two examples of what we can expect from a financial collapse. And of course, the ultimate bailout of the banks is war. Alex Jones is going to tell us how the financial community is pushing for that war as we escalate things in the Ukraine, pushing towards a conflict between the U.S. and Russia. But first, let's take a look at Greece. Greece's day of destiny turns to farce with a phantom Eurozone summit. Now, this is the take from The Guardian. They point out that Monday's hotly awaited emergency gathering of Eurozone leaders really had nothing to decide, no real agenda to discuss, because the finance ministers had not agreed to anything. So essentially, you've got all the uh, leaders of the various European countries uh, there, but their minions, they say, will have to negotiate hard and come back later in the week. Nevertheless, the BBC is a little bit more optimistic about it. Where does their optimist uh, optimism come from? Well, they're saying that it looks like they're going to impose new taxes on businesses and the wealthy. Hey, that looks great, doesn't it? Let's understand that what's behind all of this is bankers who are putting profits before people. The question before everyone at this point is, are they going to enact currency controls like they did in Cyprus, take money out of people's accounts? Are they going to confiscate pensions? Are they going to confiscate savings? Are they going to raise taxes, as they pointed out here in the BBC article? Are they going to cut services? What will we do to make sure that the bankers don't lose any money? Because that's the fundamental thing we have to be concerned about. Not what the people want, but what the bankers want. It was just last Wednesday that we reported at InfoWars that the Greeks refused to pay the debt, declaring it illegal, illegitimate, and odious. This is an article from Kurt Nemo. He pointed out that there was a Greek committee formed to look at the issue, and this is what they had to say at the time. They said, all the evidence we present in this report shows that Greece not only does not have the ability to pay this debt, but also should not pay this debt first and foremost because the debt emerging from the Troika's arrangements is a direct infringement on the fundamental human rights of the residents of Greece. Therefore, we came to this conclusion that Greece should not pay this debt because it is illegal, illegitimate, and odious. They don't just mean that, hey, this stinks. No, odious is a very specific legal term. They use that same term to dismiss the debts that Saddam Hussein had incurred in Iraq, saying that he had taxed, uh, had gone into a debt very heavily uh, to, to bankers to create an army, to create wars. It was something that was done for his own personal gain, etc. Because of all this, they just declared the debt odious and said, this is not something we're going to put on subsequent regimes. We're not going to put it on the people of Iraq. It's been done many times. So odious is a very specific legal term. And of course, many economists have been telling the people of Greece that they needed to do precisely this. It's not clear at this point whether they are going to repudiate the debt or whether they are going to do a deal with the central bankers. It is now looking more like they're going to do a deal with the central bankers. And of course, part of what happened last week was more than 4 billion euros were taken out of Greek banks by people who were afraid that the money was going to be locked up and perhaps confiscated out of those banks. So that created a liquidity problem for the Greek banks. To address that liquidity issue, they came up with the emergency liquidity agreement, and that would give them 1.8 billion euros. So not quite half of what uh, was taken out by people who were worried that they were going to have that confiscated. There's an article on Infowars.com today, Collapse Part 1, Greece, because Greece is the beginning of a financial collapse one way or the other. A collapse into a servitude of indebtedness that we've not seen before, or perhaps a an economic collapse. It starts to spread, starts to collapse the uh, European Union or the Euro. This is what Charles Hugh Smith said. He said uh, in many different articles, he said over the years he has talked about what Greece should do. And listen to some of these titles because I think they're pretty much self-explanatory. Going back to June of 2011, he wrote an article, Greece, please do the right thing. Default now. Then in February 2012, he says, when debt is more important than people, the system is evil. In 2015, January, he said, Greece at the crossroads, the oligarchs blew it. And then February 19th, 2015, Greece and the end game of the neo-colonial model of exploitation. I think that's a great way to phrase this. And he goes on to point out in the article, he says, Europe's financial aristocracy has an unsolvable dilemma. If they write off defaulted debt, they also write off assets and income streams because every debt 
is somebody else's asset, somebody else's income stream. When all those phantom assets are recognized as worthless, collateral will vanish and the system will implode. The peripheral nations of the EU are effectively neo-colonial debtors of the core nations, nations like Germany, for example, in the UK. And the taxpayers of the core nations are now feudal serfs whose labor is devoted to making good on any loans to the periphery that go bad. This is essentially what we've seen happening from the people that make up the Troika. Of course, the Troika is the IMF. We've seen this type of manipulation from the World Bank under Robert McNamara. I pointed that out last week where they would try to turn developing nations into rent seekers, not loaning them money so they could build their infrastructure so that they could create wealth, but making them dependent, encouraging them to have a welfare state, and then borrowing money to pay for that welfare state that they were unable to pay for. That is precisely what we're seeing now. The bankers are pushing this to a head. They're doing it partly with open borders, and we can see how this is playing out in Europe as well as how it's playing out in America. We know we have open borders in both places. Look at this article from NPR where they turn this into a virtue, essentially. They say on a Greek island, vacationers are lending a hand to migrants. Now, these are people who are coming in. They say 48,000 migrants have landed on Greek shores just so far this year. And of course, we're only halfway through the year. But what's happening is we have people like this 60-year-old uh, Briton who's been uh, living in Greece for quite some time. He had never seen this before, but about four months ago, he started noticing small rubber boats that were loaded with people that were crossing the narrow slip of sea, they say, separating Greece and the European Union from Turkey. So they're coming across from Turkey. Once they land, the tourists are coming out and welcoming them because the tourists aren't going to have to pay the welfare fees associated with the people who are coming in in massive numbers. And of course, we don't have to throw these people uh, back in the sea. But the issue is, how do we get from just giving someone a fish to training them how to fish? It's not going to solve the world's problems by importing everyone who is poor into the wealthiest countries. What it will do is create the Cloward and Piven strategy. And remember, Cloward and Piven were socialists. They wanted to create their socialist utopia. They wanted to implode the countries with a massive welfare state and then rebuild their utopian socialist state. And of course, what they're going to rebuild is a worldwide world governance socialist utopian state. And that's what they are doing everywhere, not just in Europe, but also in the US. They're also importing the voters. Look at this article from World Net Daily today. Mayors in cahoots with Obama on quote unquote new American voters. See, always the politicians have won by gerrymandering. They would select the voters and create undefeatable uh, jurisdictions for their political party. They couldn't get uh, all of their uh, people in throughout a state, so they would reserve one or two jurisdictions that would be heavily for the other party, but then they would make sure the rest of the jurisdictions would favor them. So they would go through with a computer, they would handpick voters. Now what they are doing is importing the voters into the country to accelerate the process. And he points out President Obama is making a big push in the final months of his presidency to convert huge numbers of recent immigrants and refugees into new Americans. And he's getting the assistance of mayors in some of the largest cities. They talk about a greater need for diversity. They talk about economic benefits that migrants bring. But critics say the program is not as much about creating new Americans as it is about creating new voters who will help to reelect Democrats who will institutionalize Obama's new policies and his new policies, especially on immigration, education, and health care. And of course, there you see in this article, right above that, you see George Soros's picture because he is heavily funding that as he is also heavily funding the uh, war in the Ukraine, bragging about that. And as I mentioned, Alex Jones is going to be breaking that down for us at the end of the broadcast. Now, the two cities that have just joined are New York and Boston. The other ones that were already there, of course, were Chicago, Los Angeles, Nashville, and Atlanta. Six states, uh, six cities that have uh, joined the New America Initiative. Of course, Soros is not just pushing war in the Ukraine. He's not just pushing a new American uh, voter agenda. He is also pushing a U.S.-China partnership. This comes from New American, and they point out that 
Since 2009, George Soros has been calling for the communist regime in China to own the New World Order. It looks like everything has been moving in that direction since the time of Henry Kissinger and uh, his uh, lapdog, Richard Nixon. But Soros goes on to say that uh, the Obama administration must make a bona fide attempt at forging a strategic partnership with China. And he gives us two choices, because that's the way they always work, isn't it? They always give you a false dichotomy. They create a crisis, and they say, well, here's, you can either do this, which you don't want to do. That's a very unpleasant uh, scenario. Or you can do this, which is what they do want you to do. They don't want you to think about any other alternatives. Now, of course, the two alternatives that he is uh, presenting us with are um, either war or making an alliance with China. And he sees it as a way of keeping Russian aggression in check by reaching out to China. But I don't think that that's going to work, and I don't think he wants it to work. I think he simply wants to push these trade agreements through. And if we understand how the TPP is working, we've been warned by Senator Sessions, who's one of the very few to bother to read what's available in this, these secret trade agreements. They make them available only to uh, the senators and the congressmen who will go there and sign a non-disclosure agreement. He's given us some broad outlines of what's there, and he says that they can add to these agreements any state that they wish. We're told on the one hand by George Soros that we have to make an alliance with China. Meanwhile, the Obama administration is telling us that we have to push through the Trans-Pacific Partnership as a check against Chinese power. What is it? Which of those is it? I guess it depends on which day you're talking to them and which thing they're trying to push. They will speak out of both sides of their mouth in order to push this through. And of course, it is precisely what the elites, the multinational corporations, want to do is this consolidation. They will use any argument to push this through. Now, what's going to happen to Greece? What's going to happen to the peripheral countries in Europe? Of course, it's not just Greece. There's Portugal, there's Italy. Italy is probably the next one on the list. Uh, Spain has had issues. They're going to go through those countries, but ultimately, as they pointed out in the New American article, George Soros wants to move to a world uh, currency. He said that uh, John Maynard Keynes, the economist who gave us Keynesian economics, had tried to push for a world currency at Bretton Woods, but he was pushed back by the American government who made the U.S. fiat dollar the world currency. Once that changes, once we are allied through the Trans-Pacific Partnership, through the Transatlantic Partnership, things are going to change very much for American people. And we can see how this is going to work out in Venezuela, of all places. This is a place that had a communist revolution. You would think that they would be working for the people. But they've had a financial collapse there, due in part to the decrease in the price of oil, but that's not what is fundamentally uh, creating the hardship for them. What is fundamentally creating the hardship for them is this dedication to making the bankers whole. Look at this article that came out today in Bloomberg. Why the iPhone 6 costs $47,000 in Venezuela. How about that? $47,000 for an iPhone. Of course, it was back in April that we saw that hotels were asking guests to bring their own toilet paper, their own soap, their own coffee, sugar, and milk because they could not get any supplies. We saw the Venezuela stores were using fingerprints. The biggest stores were using uh, fingerprint machines to make sure that people didn't come back too often and hoard supplies because everything was so scarce. That is the regime that they have created, along with currency control. So they're not only controlling currency, they are also creating shortages. We saw a year ago, back in June of 2014, the article from Bloomberg talking about how Venezuela was sacrificing drinking water to pay bondholders. They were bragging about that, talking about what a good investment communist Venezuela was. And of course, we know, if we know our history, we know that it was Bankers who sent Lenin with $10 million in to Russia to start the Russian Revolution, they have been on both sides of this. They will use any technique, any ideology. They are agnostic as far as politics goes. They have one agenda and one agenda only. They want to own everything. They want to control everything. Look at how they controlled Venezuela, of course. They say that, uh, and this was a year ago, at that point, Venezuela had paid $2.8 billion in interest overseas. Creditors. They said by the end of last year, it was going to go up to $10 billion. 
They said by putting off local companies responsible for supplying everything from diapers to cancer medication, Maduro, that is the uh, leader of Venezuela, can preserve access to debt markets. He can protect oil shipments that would be vulnerable to bondholder seizure. And then they say this. They say the government's priority is to pay the sovereign debt. That's an analyst at Barclays. And then they talk about how they have made, over the years, from Hugo Chavez, over his 14-year tenure, they made a 692% return on investment. And what do the people of Venezuela get? From this guy who said that he was for the people, this communist leader. He was for the bankers. The bankers got nearly a 700% return on investment. These people don't even have drinking water. They have no supplies. And the few people who do have money, I guess a few of the people inside the government can try to pay $47,000 for an iPhone. This is what is ahead if we don't say no to the bankers. You are committing sins of the future that you don't even know are sins yet. And according to privacy expert Brad Templeton, time traveling robots could punish us for future crimes. Today, while the AI is not that good, we are getting very good at recording everything because storage has gotten cheap, cheap, cheap. And so we are recording all that stuff that goes through Facebook, all the stuff that goes through networks, all the movements of your cell phones that I told you about, all the video from those surveillance cameras that you pass by today and ATM machines and stores and so on and here on a military basis. That's all being recorded and in the future they'll be able to analyze that data. Now these are not Terminator style robots that are going to come from the future and kill us, but they're simple AI bots that are already in existence. They'll be a little bit more sophisticated and they'll be able to comb through all of that digital digital data and be exploited by technologically sophisticated dictatorships. Online speech, for example, it's considered acceptable under today's free speech laws, but it could also be denounced as politically incorrect in the future, with the sinner subjected to retroactive fines or re-education. Just look at the way they're treating journalists and whistleblowers right now. All of that communication, all those photos, all those videos, they're all being stored in digital form indefinitely by companies like Google and Amazon. The NSA's data center in Utah can hold one trillion terabytes of data. This includes complete contents of private emails, cell phone calls, and Google searches, as well as all sorts of other digital pocket litter like parking receipts and travel itinerary. Supercomputers run 1,000 trillion calculations per second as part of a data mining process that seeks to identify suspects before they commit a crime or if they associate with terror suspects. So think of this NSA facility as the beginning of Minority Report. And it's interesting to note that the NSA claims to have shut down their massive data collection program with the recent expiration of the Patriot Act, but the agency has said that they're not gonna be deleting any of that metadata. They're just gonna hold on to it for safekeeping. They're just protecting it at the moment because they know they're going to be reauthorized at some point in the future to use it once again for data mining and combing through retro Proactively. We reported that the Swiss police released a pre-crime smartphone app which warns users about crimes before they are committed, and it's based on criminal prediction software. Numerous police departments in the U.S. are also using similar technology, such as the HunchLab prediction software. HunchLab allows officers to best forecast when and where crimes are likely to emerge using years' worth of past crime data. This type of predictive programming software is just gonna become more prevalent the smarter it becomes. And artificial intelligence like Siri and even the Google search bar become more intelligent the more that we interact with it. So they benefit from combing through troves of online data, everything that we are sharing with the internet, searching on the internet, uploading and typing into the internet. It's being stored and collected and that is the real reason for all of this data storage. And of course, it brings us right back around again to the end game of mastering the human domain. The human domain encompasses the totality of the physical, cultural, and social environments that influence human behavior, explained Admiral McRaven. Success in this domain won't be achieved by traditional ground, naval, or air forces. Instead, 
success in the human domain will depend upon understanding the human terrain and establishing trust with those individuals who occupy that space. McRaven continued by saying, building understanding of the human domain requires boots on the ground, feeding information into the network. A living active map where human beings are movable real-time landmarks and everyone's personal thoughts, feelings, medical information, belief systems, history, basically every shred of information about the individuals in any region on that map will make up the terrain. During his famous farewell address, Eisenhower warned the American people of an imminent and internal threat, a scientific elite. We must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. A tech startup, Recorded Future, that uses a system of filtering through and classifying open source data, demonstrated their predictive analytics capability during the 2012 GeoInt conference. Trajectory Magazine reports, the concept is to find people who are talking about the future. Vice President for Recorded Future, Matt Kodima says, we can basically roll back the clock. We know that this particular did happen in this time at this place. Now let's go back a week before that and look at the publications. Who was predicting that accurately? Who wasn't? Add this layer of predictive analytics on top of the other human domain analytic and you begin to get an idea of the scope and range of the overarching, inescapable control grid these scientific controllers are constructing. Around 9 p.m. Charleston, South Carolina time, horror ensued at the Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church on Wednesday. A church immersed in an American historical past involving freedom of religion, rebellion, and oppression as America grew from its reconstruction roots, attacked by modern society's ills. A lurking sickness that is completely ignored as the clear exploitation of the hearts and minds of good Americans goes unchecked. Within hours, guns and white people were being blamed. Hours after that, on the heels of getting his Trans-Pacific Partnership nearly to the finish line, a trade initiative written by corporate lawyers and designed to bypass our government and rights to a world government run by big banks, President Obama backed up the fool's rhetoric of gun confiscation to the nation. It is in our power to do something about it. I say that recognizing the politics in this town uh, foreclose a lot of those avenues right now. Obama has armed himself with a far more powerful weapon than a gun. He has executive orders, and he means to use them. Regardless of the fact that gun violence has dropped by 49% in the past 20 years, 56% of Americans believe gun crime is worse today than it was 20 years ago. Well, who can blame them? From 2007 to 2013, there were 16.4 average mass shootings per year, as opposed to 6.4 shootings annually from 2000 to 2006. According to FBI crime statistics, there were 1,043 casualties and wounded Americans as a result of these attacks from the year 2000 to 2013. Well, maybe President Obama is right then. No, he's wrong. The facts are right. Facts that blatantly show he is ignoring major factors contributing to the increase. There are key players to blame at work here. The pharmaceutical companies being public enemy number one. Psychiatric drugs have contributed to nearly every mass shooting incident in the last 20 years. But you won't find Obama blaming them. They gave him $20 million just for his 2008 campaign alone. The other culprit is gun-free zones. 92% of mass shootings since 2009 occurred in gun-free zones, according to the Crime Prevention Research Center, which created a study as a response to the statistically misleading Every Town for Gun Safety study. Blaming all white people, which angers all ethnicities that aren't subjected to the mental illness that is racism, is the other go-to dig used by the liberal media agenda. Salon's blood-boiling disinformation article, Charleston Church Massacre, The Violence White America Must Answer For, 
could be the most racist piece of garbage I've read in recent memory, insinuating it is the fault of the right-wing media, claiming white men and white families are violent, and saying all white America is violent. I can't help but challenge the author, Chauncey DeVega, to a debate. Just go look at the data, Chauncey. Black folks are killing black folks, and white folks are killing white folks. But when it comes to black on white, and vice versa, blacks double the number of whites. But I digress. The US government has been trying to take black folks guns for a long time. But black folks aren't going to sit idly by and listen to the president's rhetoric. And neither is the rest of America. As Obama's border amnesty unleashes more criminals onto American streets, criminals fleeing countries where guns are illegal. Last year, I reported how NC Fire was tabulating the full-blown crisis of child rape by illegals in North Carolina. New numbers show that there were 518 charges of child rape by illegals in North Carolina in the month of January 2015 alone. There has never been a more important time in recent history for Americans to have a gun in the house to protect themselves from what is quietly happening to American families. White black plaid or otherwise. God bless the sweet and righteous fallen souls we lost Wednesday night. May the truth behind their deaths not be in vain. United we stand, divided we fall. John Bound for Infowars.com. Nineteen people were shot and one person killed in two mass shootings over the weekend. In Detroit Saturday night, one person was killed and nine were wounded after a block party descended into chaos. Detroit's chief of police labeled the culprits urban terrorists. A similar situation unfolded in Philadelphia when a block party turned into a mass shooting. Ten people were hospitalized, including three children. Miraculously, all the victims in that shooting, including an 18-month-old girl, were listed in stable condition. While the media has been busy focusing on the heinous Charleston shooting, these two events seem to have been a mere footnote in mainstream coverage. In fact, you probably didn't even hear about these incidents until now. These two shootings were a result of black-on-black -black violence and therefore don't fit neatly into the constant barrage of race-baiting division that's currently being promoted. Wherever racial divisiveness rears its ugly head, you can be sure Al Sharpton and newly minted social justice warrior D. Ray McKesson are not far behind. After successful stops in Ferguson, Missouri, Baltimore, Maryland, and McKinney, Texas, the next destination on the itinerary was Charleston, South Carolina. Black Lives Matter protesters descended on the city this weekend and set about vandalizing a historical monument to get their point across. But according to the reaction on social media, Charleston is pushing back against the race baiters in their city by trending the hashtag GoHomeDRay. Black Lives Matter supporters don't seem to care about all lives, specifically black people killing other black people, despite the fact that black-on-black -black crime accounts for 93% of all black murder victims in the United States. It remains to be seen whether or not the Black Lives Matter protesters will stage an event in Detroit or Philadelphia. Joining us on the phone is Michelle Roten, and she is the founder, I believe, of Nurses Against Mandatory Vaccines. We spoke to her back on May the 1st because it's very important as we see all these bills coming across the United States for mandatory vaccines to understand this has been going on for a long time. And of course, it's not just in schools as we're seeing the main thrust right now. It's been against people in the health professions, especially telling them they could not work unless they got vaccines. So we talked to her about that initially, and she had a bombshell revelation within that context, telling us about the harmful effects that she had witnessed firsthand on children in neonatal intensive care, premature infants, who were given the vaccines on schedule regardless of their physical condition. And of course, their physical condition was not the same as a baby that had gone full term that was two months old. These were children that were born prematurely, and even though they were born just a couple of months ago, they were still on the same vaccine schedule. Now, before we get into the interview with an update from the Journal of the American Medical Association validating what Michelle had said, when I give you her qualifications, of course, she is a master science in nursing. We have a lot of 
uh, initials after her name. I just want you to understand what these are if you're not a medical professional. Uh, professional. Uh, the Master Science and Nursing, Registered Nurse Certified, a Nursing Interventions Classification Certification, Certified in Neonatal Pediatric Support, and a Neonatal Nurse Practitioner with Board Certification. Michelle is highly qualified, highly trained, but most importantly, she has an ethics and a morality that we see lacking in pretty much every field today, but especially now in medicine. When she blew the whistle on this practice, when she put herself out there and talked about things that other people weren't doing, it's very, very important because if you don't have ethics, if you don't have morality, all the training and certification and knowledge that you get just makes you more dangerous. And that's what we're seeing right now in the medical profession. So joining us now is Michelle Roden with Nurses Against Mandatory Vaccines. Thank you for joining us, Michelle. Thank you for having me. I just wanted to make a correction that I'm not the founder of Nurses Against Mandatory Vaccines. I'm a founding board member, so I'm one of the okay. original board members, but Amy Kenyon is actually the founder. Okay, good. Now, I want to go back and, and recall for our viewers what you told us on May 1st that you had seen being done with young uh, babies, uh, premature uh, babies who were suffering in the uh, neonatal intensive care, what they were saying about vaccines at the time. Well, I had mentioned that they go ahead and vaccinate premature infants on time, meaning that once they are two months old, they're ready for their two month vaccines, regardless of the fact that they may still have supposed to have been inside their mother's stomachs and not even born yet. Mm -hmm. And some of the things that um, are we're seeing and are being said is are things like a um, neonatologist calling from the step down unit down to level three to the more intensive unit saying, hey, I'm going to give these four babies their two month vaccines this weekend. So I just want to make sure you had four beds ready because we know they're all going to have issues and need increased care. And that was bombshell information because that violates one of the core ethics of the medical foundation uh, profession that we've always seen, and that is first do no harm. They knew this was going to harm the children, but they were going to go ahead and blindly or uh, follow this schedule. Absolutely. You know, and I mentioned that I had sat in a call room before with a bunch of providers saying, hey, we have this 25 weeker that was so strong, they never required intubation with a breathing tube to actually go onto the vent had a less invasive type respiratory support and you come in and they're like oh how embarrassing we gave that baby his two month immunizations and now he's intubated on the vent for the first time oops yeah that, and it's just kind of blown off that was amazing so you told us that on may 1st mm -hmm. and then you contacted me last week and told me about this jama study a journal of american medical association the official uh, organization of uh, MDs, and here they do a, a study about the adverse effects after routine immunization of extremely low birth weight infants. Tell us about that study. Well, um, first, extremely low birth weight infants are 28 weeks in gestation or less, or under 1,000 grams, approximately 2.2 pounds or less at birth. And you had a group of physicians and a practitioner that went into a database of a large neonatology corporation with almost 14,000 infants looked at. And what the results said were that the um, set, they were looking at the pre-immunization period versus the post-immunization period, and their sepsis workups went up 3.7 times in the post-immunization period. And sepsis means a blood infection, and so there was multiple labs drawn blood cultures, urine cultures, they go ahead and they start those babies on antibiotics right away while they wait for results. So it's not a benign thing. Yeah, it's um, life-threatening, isn't it? Right. Yep. It's life-threatening. And even if it ends up not being an infection, they've still had pain, they've had invasive procedures, and they've had antibiotics given, which is not a benign thing for these babies that have very sensitive intestines. Um, and so it's a big deal. And then we had increased respiratory support two times higher in the post-immunization period. Um, and then intubation, actually getting intubated with a breathing tube and going on the vent was about 1.7, 1.8 times higher. 
And what really shocked me, I had to read it about three times, was when I got down to the conclusion, they said, based on this, there was no difference in reaction between single shots and combo shots. And so you can just go ahead and keep giving the combo vaccines. Isn't that amazing? That was the only thing they were concerned about. Can we tweak this a little bit by giving them a combo vaccine or a singular vaccine? No, it doesn't make any difference. So go ahead and do this to them, even though, and to repeat these numbers, 112% increase in respiratory support needed post-vaccine. This is the Journal of American Medical Association saying this. A 257% increase in sepsis. That's a life-threatening infection. Just go ahead and do it because we have to follow this vaccination schedule. That is the most important thing to them, isn't it? It isn't the patient's health. It isn't their suffering. It isn't subjecting them to life-threatening situations. It's sticking to the vaccine schedule. Right. I mean, just to clarify, they didn't actually have sepsis increase that much, but they are saying that they had that big of an, of an increase in testing, surveying, and starting to treat for sepsis, mm -hmm. um, which basically just says when I talked in that other interview that these babies have apnea and bradycardia is a nice example that they're having a hard time you know, remembering to breathe, and so then their heart rate drops and things like that. That's a lot of what they're seeing, temp instability, and ability to tolerate feeds. And so these babies are, are vastly showing big cues that we're normally extremely concerned about in the pre-immunization period or any time before discharge because these babies have immune systems that are so um, underdeveloped that if you wait too long to treat them, they are going to have very bad outcomes and possibly die. But in the post-immunization period, we're seeing an increase in that. And apparently we're not worried because the whole point of the study was to make sure that these babies get vaccinated on time and that it doesn't matter what you're vaccinating with. You know, when we look at these uh, babies with low birth weights or premature babies, they're really, I think, canaries in a coal mine. We have to look at this and say, if they have this many, uh, this much of an increase in respiratory issues and response to these vaccinations, I wonder personally if there's some connection to SIDS. A lot of people have talked about sudden infant death syndrome and, and just babies that stop breathing. I wonder if there's, we don't have anything to back that up in this study, but certainly it makes you wonder uh, it makes me wonder when I look at all of these respiratory issues that are caused for these babies that already have uh, a challenged health system. Well, there's two ways to look at it. You know, premature babies are not supposed to be breathing it. It is normal for them to have some apnea and bradycardia, um, just developmental-wise and immature neurological systems. But um, having an increase is always a cue that something is going on. They don't address that in that study. We do have some studies from, I believe, the 50s following the DTAP shot showing um, increased or just apnea, but also just a vast change in respiratory breathing patterns. And of course, we haven't looked at that in decades, so we really don't have any data currently on that. You know, it's interesting when I look at this report, Michelle, uh one of the things they say, laying this out in the abstract, the introduction to it, they say immunization of extremely low birth weight infants in the neonatal intensive care unit is associated with adverse effects. This is the Journal of American Medical Association. They say it includes fever, apnea, brachycardia, the immediate, in the immediate post-immunization period. And then they go to say these adverse uh, events present a diagnostic dilemma for physicians, <laughs> whether or not they're going to give the the uh, injection of the vaccination or not. And as you point out in their conclusion, they go ahead and say, well, let's go ahead and do it because uh, we can't see any difference between a uh, single and a uh, combination vaccine. So let's just go ahead and do this regardless of the health issues. And so, you know, when we had you on the first time, we were talking about informed consent because we have bills all across the country uh, lining up to take away our informed consent as patients. And of course, nurses are people, they're patients at certain times as well. And their informed consent and being in the workforce is also very important. But then we move to this uh, issue of first doing no harm, consciously, consciously exposing babies to harm because they have to follow this vaccination schedule. Speak to us about what you see happening in ethics across, uh, uh, across the country in the practice of medicine. Um, you know, I think first no, do no harm is gone. Um, personal consent is gone. 
Um, we are all a protocol. We should all line up and be herded through. I just, I'm shocked at this study. I, I know what goes on. I'm absolutely shocked that it's okay to publish this. Yeah. They're kind of standing out there with their pants and their boxers around their ankles, completely clueless that they're flashing the whole nation right now. Um, and it is an ethical dilemma for the providers. Something that's really woven through this study is um, they're pointing out that they're looking at incidences and maybe they're looking at incidences of apnea and bradycardia and they're showing, they're, they are saying, hey, there's a sharp decrease in events in the three to five days before immunizations. And then they're giving the immunizations and they spike back up. And so they're attempting to call this, this they said, so-called healthy vaccine effect. Um, but really what you're seeing is physicians going, how am I supposed to know if this kid is sick or not sick or if we really are having a problem we need to address or if it's the vaccines? How am I supposed to be able to discern anything? And that's a very valid question. And so I, I feel like in that pattern, you do have some people attempting in this environment to do the right thing. And you have this study coming out basically attempting to tell them, please don't think this is what you're supposed to do. And studies show that if we get these vaccines in and on time, on schedule in the hospital, that we have a much higher chance of getting them done, all of them outside of the hospital. And this is our primary goal. The goal is not what is best for the patient. And I think that's the big problem that we're having in the country right now. Exactly. The goal is not what's best for the patient. And when they produce a study like this, showing these increased uh, incidences of these of various things, it seems to me if I was a parent and my child uh, suffered from this or died from this, I would want to sue them for this. It's almost like putting out their liability for everyone to see. And yet the reason they can do this, Michelle, is because when it comes to vaccines, they have no liability, do they? They have the vaccine court. If it were anything else, if they said, if we give people, if we give babies these antibiotics, uh, we see that there's a 250% increase in this particular problem, 112% increase in that particular problem, they would be sued, but they can't be sued with the vaccines. Absolutely. It's brazen. Yeah. That you can put numbers out like this and think nothing of it. I mean, I'm, I'm furious. I have questions. There are holes of data missing in this study. You talked about deaths. They mentioned that they're looking in the pre and post immunization period three days before and three days after the shot. But they also looked 30 days before and 30 days after the shot. And the only data I got about deaths in this write-up were three days after, and there were five of them. Mm. So out of the five, two of them didn't even have a diagnosis that correlated with what the reason for death was, which is I, something I have more questions about. And what, what were the deaths five days after the shots or seven days or 10 days or 14 days? Why don't I have this information? Yes, yes. Well, it's very troubling because we see that not only do they have no liability, and we've seen this for a while, but now we know that they have absolutely no ethical restraints. As you point out, it's infuriating for them to put this data out there and say, there's nothing you can do about it. We're gonna continue with our vaccine schedule regardless of the outcome, regardless of what it does to these children's health. Uh, your final comments on this. I am trying to get this study out far and wide. I just, at this point, if we can't wake the medical community up to go, hey, all of you, you need to pick this study up and you need to read it front to back and you need to highlight it and mark it and make a list of questions that you have at the back, just like I did. And, and, and I just think if this doesn't wake people up, that we are blindly doing something that is harming children and yes. this doesn't wake people up, I have no idea what's going to. I'm scared for this country. Yes. I, want, I want Duke University to be embarrassed that the lead investigator is working for them. I want the corporation where this data came from to be embarrassed. I want the hospitals and the providers. I want, I just, everybody needs to be embarrassed. You're all caught with your pants down. Get it together. And Basically. this is something that we need to disseminate, as you said, far and wide, because of course, 
We see in California, SB 277, looks like that's going to the next step this week, perhaps. Uh, and that's not the only state where this is happening. There are mandatory vaccines being uh, put out legislatively across this country. So the public needs to wake up. The medical community needs to wake up. We need to understand they have no liability. They have no ethical constraints. They will do whatever the uh, vaccine companies tell them to do. That's their marching orders, isn't it? It is. And we also have a federal bill that's been filed out of Florida. This mm -hmm. has never been a federal bill or a federal issue before. Technically, it's unconstitutional for this to be a federal issue, but I think we all know we have plenty of laws being um, passed on a federal level that are unconstitutional. So I just want all the parents to pay attention. I want all those parents that have sat in the NICU and been given coercive rhetoric about why they should vaccinate, which by the way, was the only thing I was taught regarding vaccines in my graduate degree was co coercive rhetoric, not actually any other factual information. Um, but I want them to see the study and say, hey, that was me. And yep, my kid did that. Or if you're sitting in the NICU and your kid's ready for vaccination, that you have proof. They always want you to show the science. Well, they handed it to you. You better hand it right back to them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for pointing this out. And thank you for bringing this, uh, this study to our attention. Thank you for having the integrity to stand up when these other people don't. It, it's very troubling, as you point out. Uh, there's no constitutional authority for the federal government to do this, but our constitutional and legal and political foundations are in ruins, and so are our medical ethics foundations. The idea of first do no harm, of informed consent, they have been trashed just like our Constitution. Thank you so much for joining us, Michelle Roden, uh, Nurses Against Mandatory Vaccines. Stay with us right after the break. Alex Jones has a special report. As I mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast, War is the ultimate bailout for the bankers. Alex Jones will break that down for us when we come back. Stay with us. And finally tonight, we're going to end this Monday edition of the Nightly News with a discussion of the impending threat of global nuclear war starting in Ukraine. I want to start off with a quote from Albert Einstein. I know not what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones, meaning the end of civilization as we know it. And that's if we're lucky and it's a limited nuclear war. The Atomic Energy Agency estimates that currently known stockpiles of nuclear weapons, if they were deployed, could destroy the planet, all life on the surface, bare minimum, more than 20 times. The numbers vary. But it is just mind-blowing to even imagine that our governments would be engaging in political and geopolitical activities that have taken us to a point that even most mainline analysts say is much more dangerous than the Cuban Missile Crisis in the early 1960s. The United States moved missiles into Turkey, so Russia moved missiles into Cuba. And clearly, if you go back to the early 1960s, the USSR was the villain compared to the United States and was being somewhat provocative, but so was the West. Now it's even more cut and dry that the West, via George Soros, who told Fareed Zarkaria on CNN a few months ago that he basically overthrew Ukraine and their elected government, he is now coming out and saying we're going to have World War III. And he came out again last week and said he's serious. He's really concerned about World War III when he, to a great extent, is behind it. So now we have a huge escalation. We've had U.S. troops there training Ukrainian forces for the last six months. We've had armor and other weapons being given to them by NATO. Uh, Lithuania and others are saying they're going to take weapons from NATO and send those into Ukraine. And what we have here is sectarian war, wherein the East, they're Russians, in the West, they're Ukrainians. 
Back in World War II, the country was split in two. One side was Nazi, one side was Russian. And so they're playing on those old divisions like North versus South. They're manipulating them. And this time, it's not the Russians with missiles in Cuba. It's the West with missiles and weapons right on their doorstep. And then I saw these headlines this morning. NATO will establish rapid reaction force to counter perceived threat of Russian aggression. And NATO is going into Ukraine, expanding the amount of advisors and training they're getting. Let's go over this. Secretary of Defense, AP, U.S. to provide weapons aircraft commandos for NATO, in part to counter Russia and to train Ukraine. Under the plan, the U.S. will contribute intelligence and surveillance capabilities, special operations forces, logistics, transport aircraft, and a range of weapons support that can include bombers, fighters, and ship-based missiles. It would not provide a large ground force. In Europe, U.S. forces are already there, but this is specific forces to counter Russia. Here's the Financial Times of London story from yesterday dealing with the fact that Washington is now fearing that Greece is going to go with Russia because NATO, the EU, and the West have been sucking Greece dry. That's in the Financial Times of London. So Western tyranny has destroyed the West's soft power and is driving our traditional allies from Egypt to countries like Greece into the arms of the Russians. Not that the Russians are angels, but they're not the ones offensively doing this. Our government overthrew Egypt and put radicals in that blew up churches and crucified people. Now the military dictatorship has come back in. But what is our government thinking? What is it doing? It's destabilization. Earlier today, it was reported by USA Today that Lithuania to become the first country to arm Ukraine against Russia. Again, using NATO weapons. They're a NATO member, as if Russia won't know that's being directly pipelined to them. Well, another report now has them backing out of that with the Lithuanians saying that they are undecided. Their prime minister uh, says they're undecided at this point, obviously because of Russian threats. This is unprecedented. This was never done during the Cold War. It's extremely dangerous, and it fits into the world financial meltdown we see happening with the QE4 now getting lined up, with the saber rattling with China. The globalists need crisis to finally bring in their world government as the solution to not having nuclear war. But to cause a big enough crisis to sell the world on that, they need to push us to the brink of actually having that happen. This whole thing is a giant house of cards. That term gets used a lot, and it really is apropos today because our elites aren't smarter than other elites in history, and other political groups thought they could win major wars that they ended up losing. The difference is when they lost those wars, the planet wasn't dead. So we cannot afford this. Russia has said for any militarization of Ukraine, they're going to militarize. And so what we already have is a guerrilla proxy asymmetrical war between Western-backed NATO forces and Russian-backed Ukrainian forces in the East against each other. And we don't need this to expand. This is how World War I got going. And, and, and I'm not the only one saying that. Der Spiegel had historians laying it out. Parallels in 1914, what history teaches us about the Ukraine crisis. Uh, New Republic, what can 1914 tell us about 2014? That's from last year. Uh, we've got uh, a century later, after World War I, Europe sees modern parallels, New York Times. It isn't just Infowars.com or Alex Jones that's concerned about this. It's any historian, it's any military historian, it's anyone paying attention to what's happening. And our current crop of elites have shown themselves to be so aggressive that they're willing to fund al-Qaeda and other groups like ISIS to engage in huge war crimes to destabilize the Middle East, that they're willing to create trillions and trillions of derivatives destabilizing the whole economy so they can buy up the world through fraud. So we have to point out how much danger we're in to shake people out of their malaise, to shake the general public out of their trance, to realize we could have World War III if we're not conscious of it.
In the 50s, 60s, and 70s, people were concerned about this. We were able to de-escalate things through detente and not have nuclear war. Today, we're in more danger than ever, and the weapons are more powerful than ever because the irrational exuberance of the Wall Street crew, who aren't free market, has now infected the military. The military is now taking orders, not from statesmen, not from historians, not from other veterans like Eisenhower or Kennedy, but from disconnected megalomaniacs that run Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan. It's got to stop. But history shows megalomania is a real disease, and elites always think they're invincible. A lot of elites, though, are very concerned moving into armored redoubts, uh, getting out of the stock market, you name it. We've never seen such a flurry of activity. Ron Paul thinks the big crash is coming very, very soon. I'm surprised the bubble's gone on this long. You've got the globalists trying to start race wars. There's so many things coming together right now. That's why we're ringing the alarm bells, so that hopefully we have enough of a mass awakening and enough of a mass discussion about this to move the debate back towards sanity. And, of course, most importantly, it's time to pray and to repent for all of our own decadences and corruption and to really think about what's most important in our lives. Is it entertainment and the latest celebrity sex change, uh, or is it trying to build a better world and a better civilization? Humanity is an amazing species. We can make it, but we've got to be conscious of this, and we've got to try to preserve things. All right, that's it for this edition. Great job to David Knight earlier. I wanted to come in and finish up the show just recapping uh, the excellent points he made. Please send this video and this warning to everybody you know because the world is accelerating towards expanded wars that could lead to World War III. Alex Jones signing off for InfoWars Nightly News.